Hey folks, welcome back to Keys Garage. In this video, we're going to tackle a question that uh, I see a lot of people asking online. Um, it's important. How do I determine my engine's at top dead center? I want to be sure it's at top dead center. And how do I get it mixed up? Why is my distributor rotor different in a different position when my engine's at top dead center than it is on my buddy's Dodge or Plymouth. It's different and people get it wrong and people put them together wrong. It'll work, but it may throw you off when you go to your tech manual and you're trying to look up a spec. So I've got some uh, pieces to display here to help you grasp this and help explain it to you. An oil pump, you're thinking, well, what does an oil pump have to do with top dead center? It's important, and I'll show you why. And this is probably the root, the single root problem, how people screw up their top dead center when they change the oil pump, take the oil pump out, maybe take the distributor uh, out, rebuild an engine and get it wrong. I have discussed this in my engine rebuild videos, but the, the information gets lost deep in, in the bowels of a video. So this particular video is just gonna be about top dead center, finding it and understanding it and figuring it out. You get your front timing or front, front crank pulley and it has timing marks on it. But what if your front timing pulley isn't the original? What if that's not the original crank pulley? Someone found one or maybe it was a a harmonic balancer type that had a rubber in the center area to uh, to minimize crank shaft harmonic uh, vibrations and they didn't have another one or maybe the rubber broke down and it failed and it's garbage and they they went to the scrapyard and found something else <clears throat> or got a spare engine what if it's not right and maybe they put marks on it and it, they don't add up let's get to the bottom of it i'll show you few things that work for me. I'm not an engineer. I'm not a professional mechanic. Uh, I'm just breaking it down into simple stuff so the average guy at home here can figure it out. All right, first thing I want to talk about is piston travel. Top dead center. Most of us know what this is, but we're going to strip it right down to basics because I get to see uh, data from YouTube and I can see that the majority of my viewers seem to be people over the ages of 50 and up that are getting into old cars and maybe they've never experienced or done a lot of their own maintenance before and they're, they're learning and they're new to old cars. They're coming and they're watching my videos. So this is for you who are new at this and the younger kids too. There's younger people coming into this hobby every single day. So we're going to make this really basic for people to understand. Top dead center, as the piston travels up inside the cylinder bore, this is the top of your cylinder head. This is, pretend this is a combustion chamber. When the piston gets as high as it can go, it no longer goes any higher. We're calling that top dead center. Center of what? It's top and it's dead. Why is it dead? It's the center. I'll show you why. And it's dead when it's at the center. And I'll show you why it's dead. Think about the piston moving up and down. This, this is trapped in a cylinder, but it's not going straight up and down like this. The piston does, but it's turning in a reciprocating motion. The crankshaft is spinning it into the circle. And as it goes up and down, it does this. The rod is moving. Every time it goes up and down, it changes direction, right? A circle. Would you agree that at the very top of a circle, there is a, a spot that's perfectly flat? It may be small, but it's there. So let's just display this on something, on a, on a, something round, I'll show you. Just so happens I have a round sign here, it makes a nice circle. This is the crankshaft turning, or maybe it's, you want to call it the connecting rod, uh, the bore, the rep replicates the big end of the connecting rod here, the throw in the crankshaft, it's in a circle. So as the piston's going up and down, it's traveling around like, you know, this is exaggerated, but it's going around this circle. So as the piston comes up, it gets right to the top of the circle where the, the connecting rod is up as high as it'll go, then it's going to change direction and come down the other side, right? Then it goes back up. It's rising, rising, rising. It stops right there for just a microsecond as it comes back down again to the side. Where it sits at the top, 
it's actually dead. It's not moving. It's the top. It's at the center of the, uh, the crank throw. It's at the right at the very top. It's at the center of the circle. It's dead. That is top dead center. And when you're trying to find top dead center, you may have, uh, you know, a big crank nut on the end of your crankshaft and you're spinning the crankshaft, or maybe you're grabbing the fan blade and you're turning it, take out all your spark plugs, you can do that. There's gonna be a time when you're checking top dead center, maybe you're using a wooden dowel to see the movement of the piston, and you're gonna move the crankshaft a little bit forward and back, and there's gonna be no change in the height because you're at that exact flat spot where you're at the top of the circle here, where it's not dropping yet and it's not rising anymore, you'll see that. It's a very small amount of movement, but you magnify it over the length of the connecting rod and the, and the throws in the crank. You'll be able to spin that crank just a, a couple of degrees. I don't know how many, a degree is a, is a, a percentage of the circle, right? 360 degrees in a circle. You'll be able to move it just a slight amount and the piston will not move. That's top dead center. But in a four stroke engine, the piston goes around twice. So you gotta get top dead center when it's at the top of the compression stroke. So we just quick, briefly discuss the four strokes again. This is the top of your compression. Um, this, this is the top dead center here. The cylinder is at the top. The first stroke, it comes down. It's sucking in air-fuel mixture. Then it comes back up and it compresses that air-fuel mixture. Then it blows, it, 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 uh, the combustion process occurs there. Spark forces it down. And then it comes back up again and pushes out the exhaust gas. So two times in that 720 degrees of motion, two complete circles. This is a stroke, that's a stroke, that's a stroke, that's a stroke. Four times you're doing that every time to make intake compression power exhaust with this piston. We don't want to get the engine at top dead center when we're at the top of the intake stroke. We're here, it's an intake. We're not gonna be in the right spot where we want to fire. There's gonna be some valve, valves open, valve lap, overlap there, that period. When we're at top of the center of the compression stroke, the valves are perfectly closed. We've got the most amount of compression we can make. That's when the spark fires. That's where we want our piston when we're checking for top dead center on the compression stroke. All right, I've dug out my spare crankshaft here to really illustrate piston uh, uh, position number one and number six. This is one, two, three, four, five, and six. If you look at it, number one at the front, that's your timing gear for your timing chain. Number one and number six, the throws of the crankshaft, they're in the exact same position. However, they are, the valve time between number one and number six are exactly 360 degrees out. So when number one is at top dead center, the piston is at top dead center, it may be on top dead center of the compression stroke. Number six will also be at top dead center, but it will be on the position between the exhaust uh, stroke and at the very top of the exhaust, pushing the exhaust gases out, the very top, right where the intake it's just about to occur. So you've got a bit of valve lap overlap there, but this we're not worried about valve overlap here. At this point, just understand that the two connecting rods are both at top dead center at the exact same time. Same could be said about um, number two and number five, and number three and number four. They're designed that way for balance and the way the, the smooth power uh, is delivered by the six cylinder engine, as well as the, the uh, smooth running engine. All right, so next we're gonna go back here and look at the engine. And uh, number one, of course, is at the front, number six at the back. But if you look at number six, right there, see a little pipe plug right there? That's there so that you can help uh, easily find top dead center. And the reason they put the access port uh, for top dead center at the rear of the engine is it's right in the center of where the cylinder, um, center of the cylinder where the piston uh, comes up at the top of the combustion chamber. There's no room at the front here. Um, the thermostat housing is in the way. It would be right in about this area over here. So they put it at the back. And this is where people get a little bit confused. They'll bring this up to top dead center, but are we, which top dead center are we at? 
compression stroke or intake stroke. I'll show you how to tell the difference. All right, so what I've done here is I've loosened all my spark plugs so I can easily rotate my engine by hand by just grabbing the fan blade and spinning it and the engine moves nicely. I've exposed my uh, distributor cap rotor there so I can watch it turning. Very easy to get the engine to top dead center this way. We're gonna go into this back port here. I showed you this pipe plug and open it up. So all it takes is a, uh, a 7 16 wrench just to loosen that off and pull that. It's just a tapered pipe thread. Put that aside. Go to Home Depot or some other wood supply place and buy a piece of wood dowel, oak dowel, cut off a piece. Wood is the best, won't cause any damage. And slide that down the hole. I'm touching the top of the piston. And when I spin the crankshaft by hand, you'll see that come up. See that rising? And it'll only go so high and it'll start to drop back down because that's what the piston does, right? But there will be a point, like I said, you'll see a dead spot. You can't watch me turning the engine right now, but I am, it's coming up. And then it's kind of right there, it's dead. And then it starts to go back down again. That's dead center for number six and number one. But how do we know if we're on the compression or the intake stroke? There's a couple ways you can do it. You can uh, put your thumb over the hole here where the spark plug is. And when you're on the, uh, the compression stroke, you'll get air pressure under your thumb. It'll pop, pop off. Um, not under number six, of course, because we have the uh, cylinder exposed here and the compression will just come out of the hole, but you could do it on number one. Any other cylinder, you could do that. And that'll indicate that you're on a compression stroke because you're making pressure here. I've heard of people with different engines that don't have this cavity area here. Um, they'll lay a, a ping pong ball on there. And when the ping pong ball starts to bounce and go up, you know you're on the compression stroke. So it's coming up in the spot where you need it to be. Of course, the next thing that's happening here is the, uh, the rotor is spinning around as we're going to top dead center and turning the engine over, right? See a little mark on my distributor right here? That will be factory when this is pointed, that my rotor's pointed to there. That's number one. That's where number one cylinder is at top dead center. I can confirm that by both checking the stick that in the wood dowel in the back there. It's, at, it's not moving, it's at the very top. And uh, I marked that. Actually, it was marked from the factory. When I took my engine apart to rebuild it, that little scribe, I had a little mark right there on the edge. I just made it a little more pronounced so I could see it easier. And I knew that was top dead center for my rotor. But what if, so we know, we know right now, when I look at my, uh, my cap, number one wire is sitting there and it goes off. And I can follow the wire and it goes off to number one cylinder. I know that's accurate. What if we were out 100, uh, 180 degrees here with the rotor and it was pointing over to uh, this direction right about there somewhere. And I guarantee you that number six is at top dead center right now, because I already know that. And number six, top dead center. I'll make sure I move it up there for you. It's right about there. Well, look where the uh, rotor's pointing. And what if in front of our crankshaft we're at top dead center and we could see it on there and uh that's where uh our number one spark plug was set up to go there that'll work but the rotor is 180 degrees out from factory how does how does that happen i'll show you how that happens all right so this is where the oil pump comes in the very end of the oil pump here, there's a little slot, the distributor shaft sits in it, like that, and they turn together. When I'm turning the oil pump, I hold the distributor and the rotor's turning. See that? This sits on a gear on your camshaft, this gear here, and it turns. But what if we had this, this is a, you see the tang there? The end of it straight. Let's just assume that 
it was in your engine and it was sitting like that. We're down, well, my engine, we know top dead center for number one is here. But what if somebody installed the distributor so that it was turned, the shaft was turned exactly 180 degrees, and they put it back together when they rebuilt their engine like that. I did not turn the oil pump, I did not turn the camshaft. All I did is pick up and have the rotor spin in my hand so that the, the little tab lines up with the hole in the, uh, the slot in the pump. It needs to be 180 degrees out. Many people do that. They set it up so that their rotor is now pointed up at top of the center over here. That's how they get screwed up. So you're checking that your engine's at top dead center. Number one is in a firing position. Top of compression stroke. Another way to confirm that is to remove your valve covers off the side of your engine and pull in your tappets and just wiggle them. If your valve lash is set correctly, your tappet clearance, both the intake and the exhaust will have the valve gap there that you can just wiggle them. 10, 9, 10, 9, 10, 11, <laughs> 9, 10, 11 valve of gap there. You can wiggle, you can feel it. It's because both your valves are closed completely when you're in the proper compression stroke. So you know you're at top dead center in compression. If you're out at 360 degrees and you're at the intake stroke and you're at top dead center, your valves are both not gonna be free. One of them is probably gonna be partially open and uh, they're both, you're not gonna feel the tap clear. So that's one way to do it. But when you rebuild your engine, number one is down at about the seven o'clock position. That's where your rotor needs to be down at around seven o'clock when you're looking down at a clock. That's where it is. And I, I set it that way. That's how it came from the factory. And that's uh, one way that screws people up because a lot of people, like I said, put it together backwards like that. And then uh, top dead centers over here. So that's how that happens. Nothing wrong with the oil pump. It's just how you uh, index it and put it in. I do want to point out though that if you set up your distributor 180 degrees out, like I just told you, so number one is now pointing up here at about, what is that, uh, one o'clock or so position. This is where your number one spark plug wire is gonna go. Number one is gonna go into this to the, the rotor, the cap, spark uh, distributor cap. Wires for number one cylinder is gonna go right above that. It'll work, it'll work fine. It just screws people up because they're out because everybody else, maybe not everybody, but most people, number one is down here. So the number one wire is over here. It works. It just throws your people off sometimes. Our piston is at top dead center, number six and number one. They're at it top dead center. I've got my rotor pointed towards position uh, number one there for my number one spark plug wire. That's where I want it. So that's two things we've confirmed. The third one is if this is set up right down on the front of the timing, uh, there's timing marks on the front of the crankshaft pulley down there, and they uh, should be real close to zero degrees. Let's see if I can zoom in on that for you. Can you, can you see my marks down there? There's a 10 at the top end, a 10 at the bottom, it's 10 degrees before top dead center or after, and the zero is in the center. There'll be a zero mark there. So I've done three things here to verify I'm at top dead center. There's a fourth thing you can do. We talked about removing the, uh, the valves, the valve cover, and verifying the tap clearances. Right, let's get into the uh, crank pulley here now, and you can see the markings on my spare pulley here. It's upside down. It's DC, dead center. Each line represents one degree of uh, the crankshaft turn there, up to 10, before top dead center, after top dead center. So that can be a little hard to read with a timing light, of course. It's down, buried down beneath the uh, the radiator there. Need a good light. But um, I cleaned that one up with a wire brush. I'd help get some brake clean, get a wire brush. This is a paint pen. They sell them at the store, of course. Um, go into zero. And just, this is a fine little tip paint pen here. Shake it up, get some paint out of it, come out. But I'm going to mark top dead center right there. I could mark 10 above and 10 below as well. So the center line is my timing mark for top dead center. Now assume you've got a crankshaft that may not be stopped, you're not convinced it's right. 
set up your engine so that you're at number one, top dead center, um, all the ways I showed you. If you want to be really accurate again, check your valves, your tappets. And there's a pointer on the front of your engine that'll point somewhere on the crankshaft. Just mark it with a paint pen. It's not scientific. It may not be specifically exact at zero degrees. It'll be very close. At least you're going to have a timing mark that you're going to use as a reference with your timing light. So as this thing's spinning around at whatever, 500 RPM, and it's flashing, you're watching that center mark and you're adjusting your timing. Um, there are published specifications for where the manufacturer wants to see your timing set, two or three degrees before top dead center, whatever it is, zero degrees, right on top dead center, in some cases on old cars. You can really feel it. You can get up there, you can drive the car, you can idle a car, you can hook up a vacuum gauge. There's other ways to get it dialed right into where you want it so that it's accurate. You don't have to specifically know every line here on the, uh, the pulley. You can feel it. Just tune it up and feel it and, and put your vacuum gauge on and get the most amount of vacuum at idle and you'll have your timing vegetable bang on where you want it. Go for a drive, go up a hill. If you feel it pinging just a little bit, just back it off, back off your timing so that it's not quite uh, advanced and until the pinging, just till the pinging goes away. The odd little ping once in a while on a steep hill in a full car like this is okay. You don't want to ping it all the time. That means it's firing too soon. And the reason we have to move the timing, maybe you should know this too, is the amount of time that it takes from the flame to travel, when the, when the spark plug ignites the air fuel mixture and the flame has to travel from the spark plug down to the top of the piston, as the piston moves faster and faster and faster, the flame, you've got to account for the different speed of the, uh, the piston moving quick, too quick for the flame travel. So we'll, we'll advance the timing so that it fires just a little bit sooner so that it's getting down and it's traveling down and it's reaching the top of the piston, the combustion, the flame, right at the right time where we get the most amount of power. So we're adjusting it for that specific purpose. This is why we're advancing the timing. If you're, when you retard the timing, um, it does it automatically when you first start the car. This car has vacuum advance um, and there's, there's springs in there. It's retarding the timing when I first start the car. It's doing it automatically. That's so it's easier to start. Um, if, if the timing is too far advanced, it's going to be hard to start the car. It's going to labor. You're going to hear your starter, especially on a six volt. It's, it's not going to like it. It's, it's going to be uh, laboring to start and turn over the engine. So vacuum advance and the spring in the vacuum pot helps pull that back and you get retarded when you first start. As soon as you start, you got vacuum. The vacuum again pulls in the, uh, the, the vacuum advance and sets it uh, to where you've got to adjust it at idle. Maybe it's two degrees before top dead center, whatever that looks like. The other thing you do is, uh, if you're not sure if the springs in your distributor are working properly, there are two springs hooked up to the, uh, these counterweights on your, on your rotor as it spins, this is your distributor shaft. They open up. Are they working? Um, quick way to check that is just put your timing light on the engine while it's running and watch it. And uh, once you've got your timing set where you want it, you're revving up the engine, the timing is going to advance. You're going to see it advance because these springs, as it spins, these things start to open up. And uh, there's two different uh, tension springs here. One is a, a light spring, it opens easier at a lower RPM. And this one is a, a higher tension spring, it's thicker and heavier it needs more RPM before it starts to open. If your timing is not advancing when you are revving up the engine, um, there's probably a problem with the weights here. They're stuck, they're not opening and allowed to swing open as they should with uh, the centrifugal motion of this spinning. Um, you can rev your engine to a certain RPM, what do you want, 1,000, 1,500 RPM. The timing will advance and it should stay there. If you hold the RPM, it should stay there. That's because these are fixed in an open position and they've advanced the timing. So uh, check those, make sure they're working properly. And as mentioned, these are advancing the timing because at a higher RPM, the piston is traveling way faster than it is at idle and the spark the flame has to travel that same distance. It travels at the same distance all the time. The flame travel speed does not change. So it will change when it arcs and when the spark plug arcs so that it comes down at the right time in the pistons, just at the right spot. And you know, I gotta say, back when they figured this out, I don't know, Delco Remy did a heck of a job many years ago, probably a hundred years ago, I guess, or close to it now, to figure all this out. In the old, old cars, you had to manually advance the, uh, the spark yourself 
you retard it, start the car, and then you rev it up, get the speed you want, and you just advance your timing to the maximum power, and you were done. It's all done automatically with springs and vacuum advance. Pretty cool stuff, really. Very cool. All right, folks, I hope maybe you picked something out of that that you find interesting. If you have any questions, go ahead and post them. Thanks for sticking around on Keith's Garage. If you like what you see, please subscribe. Thumbs up. Appreciate it. Um, maybe there's one, one, one last thing I'm going to tell you that I learned I never thought of before. Different Mopar engines. You think a lot of the parts are interchangeable, and they are, but this particular pulley has a different width of a groove in it than the pulley that's on my Plymouth. I went to try and consider a different uh, pulley or a V-belt system for my fan to speed it up, and I had a spare fan pulley, but the groove width is different. And these would be weighed, certain weight, depending on how much horsepower your engine makes, the, uh, the, the size of the engine, the uh, uh, displacement. This one would probably be a little bit heavier than what you'd see on a stock 201 engine in an old Plymouth. This would be maybe off a 265 or a, a 251 engine. It's going to be a little bit heavier, and it's got a wider V-groove in it, so they're not all interchangeable. There you go. Have a good one, guys. We'll see you in the next video. Thanks for sticking around. For the folks that stuck around, bonus material. So thank you for sticking around. You're getting a special treat today. I got spark plugs out, and I got this engine uh, to the point where... You know, making a video, I might as well do a compression test. Um, I got about, I hit a thousand miles. I did put a thousand miles on my engine rebuild this summer. So let's see if the compression has uh, risen at all after it's been broken in. And I feel like it has. It feels good. I climbed the hill home and, and uh, you know, she's pulling it harder and faster. Um, I remember the old engine, even though it ran well, had a, you know, a little less compression. After I set the valves, it improved. Um, but I found that broken piston ring in there, remember? So anyways, I was pulling the hill, same engine, just it was a 226. Uh, I was, you know, hitting 30 uh, miles an hour, dropping to 25 miles an hour. And sometimes I could really hit it hard and maintain just about, uh, you know, 30 miles an hour, 50 kilometers an hour, coming up the hill, leaving it in third gear. More often than not, I'd downshift anyways, take it easy on the engine. But now, 237 cubic inch, and it's, the rings are seating nicely. I'm getting good compression. I'm sure it's up because I'm pulling that hill now. I can easily maintain uh, 40 miles an hour in third gear, no downshifting. I can fly up that hill. So it just keeps getting better. This has been a fantastic uh, improvement to this car, rebuilding the engine. Let's have a look at compression. All right, we're back at number five. <laughs> Yeah, 100, 110 or so. So there you go. That's what I'm at. Broke in 1,000 miles, 110 PSI. I'm happy. Tell me how you're getting 120 <laughs> or above that with a stock engine. All right. So yes, indeed, the compression is up and it continues to rise. I don't know where the top is. I'm, I'm thinking 110 is probably as good as I'm going to get at this elevation. Um, when I first rebuilt the engine, I think it was around 100 to 105 PSI. Now I'm seeing 107, I'm, I'm tapping on 110. And, and why is that? It's because everything is wearing in nicely. My piston rings are going up and down the cylinder walls, you know, thousand times a minute, you know, more, 2000 times a minute on the highway. And um, they're nicely seating in. The, the carbon is wearing into the steel cylinder walls and they're getting a nice tight wear pattern. Everything's just perfect. Gotta love old flathead engines. I love them. Um, Long live the flat, flat.